Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today I have with me in the studio artist Annie Darling. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you for having me. You actually have the best name, Annie <laughs> Darling. Has anybody I've heard said that before? You, I'm gonna I'm gonna assume so. Yes. Yeah. Do you feel like it contributes positively to your life in a way? I suppose. I suppose it is a positive name, and I have been commented on it or called Darling a lot. So that's kind of well, nice. Yeah. I guess it's good if you like the person, right? Yes. <laughs> if you don't like the person, that's maybe a little bit insulting. But Well, no. I like it either way. Yeah. So, Annie, how did you come to Maine? I grew up near Chicago, and um, my parents actually are the reason I moved to Maine. But um, while in Chicago, um, we my, my father was a professional photographer, and my mom, an interior designer. She worked at the Merchandise Mart. And so um, we took trips into the city all the time to go to museums and art galleries, and that's where I first fell in love with art. Um, but then my parents wanted to, to move, and we had friends in Maine, so we came to Maine when I was 11. So I've been here a long time. Where'd you grow up? I grew up outside of Chicago, in Barrington. But oh, when you came Maine? to Maine? Oh, yeah. um, in South Portland, Cape Elizabeth. Okay, yeah. and where did you go to high school? In South Portland. That is where my mother graduated from high oh, school. So yes, nice. we're keeping it in the family yeah. here. Yeah. Do you feel like your high school experience um, in any way directed you towards the, the education you would eventually seek out in communications? And No, not really. I, I took an art class there, and I, I wasn't inspired by it. So it really wasn't until college that I sort of went that direction. I drew all my life. Like my first drawing was when I went to the Art Institute and, and uh, in Chicago and I came back and I drew these pictures of Jesus on the cross when I was seven. So I, was, I must have been inspired by the painting. And so I've always drawn. That, that was my big thing was drawing. And uh, so I kind of found, found it through design and in college for the most part. That's a that's a very dramatic and specific thing for a seven year old to uh, bring back home and decide they want to do some I work know. on. I know it's kind of funny. Yeah. So, do you have a sense for what it, what it was that struck you about that, uh, that particular piece? I think it was that um, the contrast and the light. And my dad, being a photographer, I saw a lot of photography when I was young. And I, when I was in college, I couldn't decide whether I wanted to do design or photography. Those were my two sort of choices in terms of career direction at that point. And um, so I, I just think I was always, um, I was introduced to the concepts of photography really early through my dad. And so I think what I saw was sort of the, in my little drawing, you know, I think I saw a lot of contrast and, and some really feeling in the artwork. And it just, it must have touched me, you know, to come back and draw that. So, so yeah, it was kind of neat. So in my family, a lot of the conversation around the table, because my father was in medicine and my mother was a teacher, was kind of focused on those professions. Yep. Around your table, did you have conversations around photography or design? Oh, yeah, constantly, constantly. My mom was always talking about her jobs, you know, her projects that she was working on. She would, I would go with her sometimes to help. Same thing with my dad. I would go into his studio in Chicago, which was really fun because um, he had M&Ms there. That was one of my favorites back then. And... Um, so I was, I was around it all the time, and, and they were talking about it a lot. And, of course, our home was beautiful because my mom was an interior designer. So I just got it um, sort of intrinsically. My uncle, my father's twin brother, also was a sculptor and taught at Cooper Union in New York. And so uh, I spent time in New York with him. And so and my, I have a printmaker, and I have a lot of artists. And my, my family is pretty much all artists. How did you blend the the design part of your life and the communications part of your life? How did what did that look like for you? Well, I bounced around in college because I really couldn't figure out what I wanted to do, and I wanted to self design a major, but it was too much paperwork, so I just self designed a major myself. <laughs> so I started off in industrial technology, um, and I did that for a couple of years, and then um, and architecture and printing was involved in that too. And then right at the verge of computers, that's how old I am. Um, and then um, I did some design classes, some art classes, some communication classes. And when it came down to it, it was um, I could graduate the easiest uh, doing a communications major, which is what I did. But I loved interpersonal communication and, um, and uh, just some of the – I like psychology too. <laughs> that's one of my passions is psychology. And so um, that all blends together. It all blends together in the art and the design world. Especially, I went into advertising right after college, 
And so psychology is huge in that. So it kind of gave me a different perspective on art and the visual language. Give me an example of that. Well, the medium is the message. You know, how, how what, what we say and how we, how we say it is more important than what we say, whether it's visually or in person, in language. And so that really was something that I was drawn to, is how we can influence others. Um, a color theory is a great example in the art world, is color really has a lot of impact. So those are, um, those are the, some of the things that I really appreciate and work with every day, is I love just the basic principles of design and art, you know, whether it's line, form, movement, color, um, uh, balance, structure, contrast, those things, th those, that's, I'm really interested in the tech, kind of the technical aspects, which is, I think, why I ended up being a designer, because <laughs> it was a little more techie. I have a little techie brain in me. Well, I love that you're um, explaining this to me, because as someone who was not trained in art or design, I, I continue to learn as I go along. So when, when somebody says, I have a background in design, for you to be able to say, oh, color theory or line, I mean, I, I think that that gives those of us who don't have as much knowledge about it a sense of what it is that this actually means that you are um, working on. It's it's really it's those are the interesting things. I'm teaching a workshop this weekend in Cape, and so I uh, um, it's a collage workshop. It's very simplistic, but I broke it down into those categories. And I think I think to understand those, it it narrows the field so people aren't so afraid of it. You know, they can everyone can relate to line or color those types of things. So it's, it's breaking it down to the simplest aspects. Do you think that people are afraid of art or diving into it? I think people are afraid that they're not artists. You know, people are like, oh, I can't draw. I can't do this. I'm, I'm not an artist. And I used to feel that way when I was young where um, I, I wasn't, uh, I was always an abstract illustrator, so I could never draw people. So I was like, well, I can't draw. So I think people have that inherent uh, piece of them that says I can't do this or this is scary or this is too too much so but I think everyone everyone can be an artist and is an artist in whatever it is they do what I'm fascinated by is that um, you have in front of you a series of <laughs> notes that are actually kind of illustrated and designed yep. about things that yep. were just kind of prompting you what yeah. you, what you thought might be helpful to talk about but I love that they're I mean, even just looking at them, they're very, they're very visual. You know, yes. that you've drawn a few pictures and, you know, the way that you've drawn your letters. Um, and you talk about, on one of these, you talk about the linear and organic aspects mm -hmm. of you. Yeah, I, um, I think one of, the, one of the problems, I hate to say problems, one of the issues I've come up against in my own art is that I have sort of two styles of art. So I have a geometric style that I've been working on for quite a long time, but I started with a landscape style. And so I, I never felt that they went together, although other people would say, I can see you in your art no matter what the art is. Um, but for me, it feels like, oh, there's two different personalities. And so um, I wrote down on one of my cards, um, sort of, I, I am sort of a split personality where I have this linear side, which is thoughtful, design-oriented, detailed perfectionist uh, discoverer side. And then I have this really organic side, which is emotional and free flowing and passionate and curious and, um, and meaningful. And so I sort of use different as aspects of myself for each, uh, for each thing, for each style that I have. Um, but it is all me. It's just, <laughs> it's just very, to me, it just seems divert like two divergent roads. Um, but I've bought, brought them together over the years um, and kind of brought some of the landscape into the, into the more geometric work. And you can see some of the texture of the, the landscape work and the geometrics. And, and the landscapes even have some geometry to them. In looking at your work, because I was at the Portland Art Gallery, mm -hmm. I, I noticed there was a very unique texture to the piece that I was looking at. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that. Uh, it's a pretty involved process that I use. And... Um, I, when I was moving from working on the, um, the landscape work and going into the geometric work, um, I, I was trying to figure out, oh, how, how do I do this? So, so what I ended up doing is I work flat, first of all, um, in my studio, which is why I can't work too big because it's only as far as I can reach. So, um, so I work flat and I actually use a snowboard iron and drip the wax onto the paintings um, and then I smooth it out. So on the on the one that's in the gallery, there's a whole um, 
series of layers of just texture. So because I'm dripping and smoothing out with the iron, the the wax um, the wax doesn't stay in one place. The wax the wax kind of does what the wax wants to do, and so um, so it's kind of bumpy. It's not it's not even. And then um, after that, I can heat it up a little bit and take a brush and go through it with a brush and create texture, and then use a, use some tools to, to do some etching into it. Um, so in the piece that you saw, there's wax on the bottom, then there's some textural activity with brushing, and then after that, um, um, I do an oil stick inside. So, so what happens is it really picks up the base of the texture. So if there's any divots in it, the, the, um, the uh, pigment will stay in there, and then, um, and then the rest I can wipe clean. So you'll see these black marks, almost like etching, which I love etching. So, um, so that you have the etch surface. And then um, what I do is I work with oil um, and a little bit of um, sometimes some other mediums uh, and paint on top. So then I'm making a choice of where I want to put the color and where I don't. And the fun thing is um, the, uh, the encaustic medium is kind of a luminous medium, and you can actually rub it up, and so it, so it has a kind of a shine to it. Um, and then the oil is, is, is matte, so I have this kind of relationship between the matte, and this is sort of a design thing, um, but sort of a, the matte tones next to the, next to the um, brighter tones. And so, so it has all kinds of texture because of all, these, all the layering and all of the, um, the different mediums that are with it as well which is what I love. Well, that was kind of what I was thinking, was that as you're describing um, working on encaustic pieces and you have, you're bringing in all these different facets of um, exploring form, I guess, um, that it, it sounds like there has to be a playfulness involved because you're not necessarily maybe ahead of time able to say, well, I would like to have the wax go here, mm -hmm. here, and here. Right. It's very hard to control, very hard to control. And I don't plan typically plan my paintings ahead of time. There's a couple of paintings I've actually drawn out and said, oh, yeah, th let me try it, let me do this. Some of the larger geometrics are like that. But mostly um, mostly I, I sit with the canvas and I just allow it to create itself. And it will. And part of my process really is kind of this communication between me and the work. And so I do something, I'm, I do a layer, or I'll make some marks or whatever, and then I'll, I'll kind of let that speak to me. And then it tells me, okay, I need to balance. And these are all sort of the design education really helps me because um, in something like that, where where I'll have an element that I just drop down, and then it's sort of that sensibility that tells me what do I need to do next? Do I need to balance it? Do I need to, you know what do I need to do from sort of a design standpoint? I kind of use that memory of mine to sort of feel it out and I'm always feeling it out. So I'm doing the next thing and I'm feeling that out and then I'm feeling the next piece. So so one piece, one drop, one ev anything that I do informs the next. And that's the discovery for me that I really enjoy is, is just kind of allowing it to lead me into a, into a direction and it, it does it on its own. They, pa they paint themselves sometimes. How long does it take to create one of these pieces? Because it sounds like a very involved process. It can be, it can be. Um, Different pieces take they take their own time. Um, some pieces that are very simple take a long time. Some pieces that are very complicated take a short time. I call the pieces that take a short time my personal masterpieces because usually and usually it's typically at the beginning or at the end of doing a series. So I do work in series where I'll decide that I'm going to do do um, some geometric pieces or whatever, and they're going to have this sort of style or feel or size or whatever I choose. Um, and usually at the very beginning or the very end. They take a shorter amount of time because I'm free. So at the beginning, I'm free to create whatever I want. There's no there's no set thing that I'm trying to go for. And then same thing at the end. Well, I've created a bunch. I don't really need this piece or whatever. Uh, you know, my mind just goes and and again, I have freedom at the end. So I feel like uh, that uh, those works. Oftentimes, I will note that those works are some of my best works because they're created with less of me, and more of the work. The work is just driving itself. So I have a really great piece that came together in a really short amount of time, and it's one of my most beautiful pieces. And I feel like I didn't create it. It just kind of created itself. So different and, times. And how does just the, the practice, the experience, how does that kind of weave its way in? Oh, it's always learning. I'm always learning. And I'm, I, I like to push the medium. I really like to push the medium. So 
I'm constantly every every series is is takes what I ha- what I d- did before and just compounds that and goes into more and more and more. So I feel like every every single painting is an experience, and um, and then that experience just gets imbued to the next painting. And I feel like my work um, maybe like maybe unlike other work is um, I can't even recre- recreate my own pieces. If I try to recreate, like somebody might want a commission and say I want it to be like that painting and it's impossible it's because of the wax because of the medium so I can get close I can get the same feel or whatever but I can never really recreate a painting so that's kind of enjoyable for me that every piece is its own creation so it sounds like in your case the discovery process is really important and I guess I'm wondering if this over time, this experience that you're drawing on has helped you to bring the linear side of you together with the organic side of you in this discovery process. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, it it is, they are morphing one into another. They're becoming more of, more of one because I'm taking some of the textures I've had in the landscape pieces and you'll see them showing up in the, in the graphic pieces where the graphic pieces were a little less textural, at the beginning, and then you'll see some of those forms and shapes and some of the textures coming back into the landscape work. So all of the, all of the discovery I do is part of, it's part of the growth process for me and it's part of what keeps me, that's where my passion is, is, is discovering something like, oh, I, I've never done that before. Oh, that does that, wow, I've never done that. And that happens almost in every painting, which is surprising because it's, I don't know, it's surprising to me that I keep learning and learning and learning. You'd think that I would know what I'm doing by now, but <laughs> but in a way, I'm always discovering something new. And I love the exploration process, and it's a form of play for me to paint. You know, painting for me is is um, is is really all about that exploration. It's really all about seeing what can happen and and allowing myself to go wherever it takes me. Do you think it is hard for people to allow themselves to play? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think people, um, like when I think of my classes, that I teach classes, and um, they're always so nervous. And I'm like, who wants to play? Who wants to have fun? This is supposed to be fun. And people actually come to my, I do a little encaustic classes as well. And um, so people come because they have fun. And then everybody thinks that they're not going to create something great. Like they all think, oh, this is going to, you know, my piece is going to be awful. And then they come out and they're like, oh, my gosh, this is fantastic. Um, and again, I think teaching that way, it's sort of bringing it back to the basics where I say to people, don't use all the colors. Just stick with the warms or stick with the cools and trying to lead them to success through limitation, which I do in my own artwork a lot of times. I'll limit myself and say, okay, this this is only going to be, this is going to be monochromatic or dichromatic or take, take something away and make it simpler. And that actually can lead to really great discoveries. Yeah, you raise an interesting um, idea, and that is that sometimes it's what isn't there that um, makes something seem more cohesive. Yes, yes. I think taking away and making it it as um, as refi- it's almost re- like refining it, like Steve Jobs. He just kept sorry. He just kept taking away and taking away and taking away, and that's why his products are so beautiful. It's not, it's what's not there. You know, you don't need the extras, and so I try to work with that too, not having too much. Plus, I'm visual stimulation for me. I cannot stand a lot of visual stimulation, so I need sort of a really quiet space. So for me, the taking away process is part of what soothes me as a person. When I've talked to other artists, I've... Sorry, Kevin, I will definitely get watered before the next one. When I've talked to other artists, they've suggested sometimes that they are listening to music while they're in the studio Mm -hmm. or listening to podcasts (laughs) while they're in the studio, but... You've at least described kind of a quiet visual space. Are, do you listen to anything? Um, yes. When I uh, when I first started painting, I was going through a divorce, and I was listening to heavy metal. And you'll see it in my work. The work was black and red and orange and yellow and white, and, and it was just really dark because I was going through a dark time. 
And now, and, and then I would listen to podcasts, but the problem is when I look at a painting that I've done and I listen to a podcast, I'm like, oh, there's Joe Rogan's season, you know, whatever. So I, I, now I listen to nothing but like upbeat, happy songs because, because those kind of wash away in my mind and I don't connect a particular song with them. I just connect happiness with it. So I'm very influenced by what I'm listening to. So I've, I've kind of, and you'll see, if you look at the trajectory of my work, you'll see it go from very dark to very light and from very monochromatic, um, and, and color, less color to, to right now. It's like these colors, it's blues and greens and brights. So you can see that trajectory in my life, um, as an artist and, and, um, you know, Picasso had his periods, you know, the blue period, things like that. And I think as artists, we have our periods of time, and and they're very much reflected. Um, where we are is reflected in our work. My artist statement at the end of my artist statement, it it talks about being being seen exactly as you are in the moment, um, good or bad. And um, I feel that as artists, we're really being vulnerable. We're really showing um, ourselves in our work, whether we whether we want to or not. Um, it shows up and. For me, I feel like it's very inherent in my work. You can you can see where I am. You can see you can see periods of time where I was struggling by that my work isn't good. Like I've had periods of time like, wow, that was a really bad time. Look at that work. So you can see where my work really reflects where I am as a person. That's a that's kind of a big deal to have that <laughs> level of vulnerability to to be looking at this dark piece and putting it in front of somebody else and wondering. Do they know that I was going through a divorce at that time? Do they know where my mental um, health was at that time? How do you handle th the way that that might make you feel, being vulnerable with putting your art into the world? Well, the interesting thing is people relate to it. You know, people will relate to their own um, their own lives through that work. So people who like the darker work, there's some reason why they're drawn to it. And so I feel like that is um, part of it. Um, I was looking at one of Dietland's paintings last night at um, Portland Art Gallery, and it just had this beautiful blue with this contrasting golden color. Um, and it just gave me just, just this really beautiful sense. And so I could sense where she, I've seen her work throughout the years, so I know, you know, kind of what she's done and what her, her work has looked like in the past. And, and um, it had some freedom to it, and it just had some different qualities. And I actually spoke to her about it because I could see um, I could see how she had changed and grown, and I brought that up to her, that for a while her, her work was um, uh, was in a sort of, in a, in a certain box, and then all of a sudden I saw her get out of that box. So as an artist, knowing that kind of that happens, I could see that with her. So I, I, I said that to her, that it was really fun to see her growth and acknowledge that for her. So I, I feel like people relate to it, like I can relate to that, I could see that because I have done that in my work, in my life. When I interviewed Lois Lowry, and she's the author of children's books and young adult books and some adult books, um, I had read up on many of her pieces because she's very prolific. And I remember bringing up to her in the interview, um, oh, I this book, that one of the first books that you wrote, and it said this, this, and this. And it was interesting. Her response was almost as if, yes, I, I can... I appreciate that that part of my life, and also it's kind of behind me. And mm -hmm. now I'm at my kind of in my most recent work. You know, it's not that she's discounting mm -hmm. the the first thing that she wrote, but it's more like she's more fully connected to what she most recently wrote. I feel that way too. In that, when you look back on your work, when you can see your work, like I can see my work all the time. Um, when you look back on your work, you can. Uh, you can see growth, and sometimes that growth means, like what I just said, it's you're looking back on some things that might not be so great. You're looking back at your learning. You're looking back at your growth, um, in, whether it's art or relationships or whatever. You make mistakes or you, or you um, don't do things in a way that you wished you could have done them. And then, and then you grow and you actually do that, and then it's really exciting. And, you can, and I think sometimes looking back on... Um, some of the work that you've done, it's not necessarily an experience of shame or whatever, but it's an experience of like, oh, you know, it's kind of cringy sometimes to look back on work that, that you may have thought was good at one point because that's where you were at. But now that you're at another level, it doesn't, 
you know, it, it's not as good. You don't appreciate it as much as you did in, in that moment. So it's kind of scary. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think you've just described all of life, mm-hmm. that you look back on your life and say, right. oh, that's really cringy. I wish I had never done that. Right, right. And in art, you get to do it in public. <laughs> Annie, what is it about the upcoming year that excites you? What is it that you are working on right now with your art that um, is going to kind of continue to evolve and you're going to share with the world? Um, right now, in the winter, I usually take at least a month off um, because I find with anything – any job you have, when you don't take time off, what happens is everything gets stale. Um, so I usually in the wintertime focus on marketing and focus on uh, other things. And, uh, and, and I sit with what's going on. I sit with what happened last year. I sit with these things and then they bubble up and form into something. Like I never know what the new, what the next body of work. So usually I create sort of a body of work a year. Just, I, I sort of take off with some sort of idea or curiosity or something I want to discover. And then that ends up blossoming into something. Typically, um, I'm taking from old, from, uh, from the past. So one example is there's a work called, um, called Lonely Worlds, um, and which will be at the gallery soon. And, uh, so that piece is a piece that I did. It was the only light piece actually that I did after I got divorced. And it was a, um, it's a 24 by 48, and it had it's mostly white with a lot of texture in it. And then there are these groups of really small dots in three places. And then there's one small black dot, which represented me. And I just felt really far away from everyone. I felt lonely. And I felt like everyone else had someone. Everybody else was in a group. Everyone else, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and here I am all alone. So that was my expression of that. And then that was my first um, geometric piece. I didn't know it at the time. But then, um, then my circles got larger, and then my circles got larger, and then my circles got larger, and the pieces that are at the gallery now, the circles are huge. So, so I, I took this little circle, and then I expanded on the circle once, and I expanded on it twice, and then I expanded on it a third time. So that's kind of what happens to me is, is I'm like, what if, you know? And I, for some reason, I'm addicted to circles. I love circles. Um, and so, and, and two, that meant community to me. So when we were talking about story, um, you know, here I went from being this little teeny tiny circle that was all alone, and then um, I wanted to build community. So you'll see a lot of the work after that with lots and lots of circles. And so I, and I found community, oddly enough, as I was searching, I found it. And you can see that uh, obviously my community is huge now because <laughs> these circles are huge. Um, so it's, and it is, it's true, you know, being with the gallery, community. So, uh, so it's a reflection of my life too, but also these, um, these little aspects will be one little aspect that I want to explore. Like I wanted to explore the circle. Um, and it could be, um, in the landscape work, it could be just really working with the texture. Like I found out how to do this new texture. Oh, I can do that. Now let me see what I do when I expand that out. So all of the work is based usually on something from the last piece. Just like you would take lessons from a relationship and move forward to into another one. Something well, like hopefully. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not everybody does. Some, some people just recreate the same work over right, and over right. again. Yeah. The same relationship yeah. over and over again. And that, um, we were talking earlier about um, about me feeling like, um, like my work is kind of dichotomous, if that's a word. Um, and, and that's something that I worried about is that I wasn't creating the same thing over and over. I was going over here and then way over here and then way over here and then way over here. Um, and being comfortable with it still being my work was difficult um, because it it was felt to me like it was all over the place. But really, it was all learning to get to wherever I'm going. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's OK. Yeah. And I and I love the idea that you take time off in a year because it is, it's, it's like having fallow ground. Mm-hmm. I think the first, first radio show I ever did was with an author, uh, Liz Peavy, whose mother oh, had love died. Oh, Liz. Love yes. Liz. Yeah. And her mother had died, and she had written a play. And she talks about this idea of fallow ground. Mm-hmm. And she talks about this, this kind of just letting things rest because, you know, you need to get through the winter, right. and then the spring things will come again. And when I talked to Linda Greenlaw, who is another author, 
she talked about how in the wintertime she writes and in the summertime she's out on the ocean. So I, I think what you're describing is so powerful and, and giving yourself permission to say, this is actually part of the creative process. Mm-hmm. Taking time away is actually part of the mm-hmm. creative process. We do not all need to be 100% moving forward all the time. Well, and I work alone. So I'm in a small place by myself a lot. And I'm my being is a tactile being, a sensual being, a being who needs to see and look. And so so to me, when I when I take that time, I make sure to go places. I'd look at other art, very inspired by other art, obviously, since I was a kid. Um, and I need to see things. I need to touch things. I need to hear things. So that's, you know, that comes back and, and is my inspiration. It's not... Um, it's not always, you don't always see the inspiration in the work. It just feeds me somehow and allows me to sort of be able to give again. And I love that process. And I I need that process. I can feel it in my body when I need to, when I need to go. I'm like, okay, I gotta go. Where are you going next? (laughs) California to see my son. Very good. So it's kind of a dual purpose. Yes. I'm going to paint a painting for him for his living room. I'm painting a commission for one of his friends. And then I'm seeing some friends from Maine who live in California now. So that's That's really wonderful. There's like so many things woven into that one trip. And a friend who I met uh, in the airport, in the airport bathroom. And we became best buds, like just meeting in the Boston airport on the way to L.A. A couple of years ago. So we're going to see each other, too. Life is interesting. Life is interesting. It's all the circles you're talking about. Yeah. All those circles. Well, Annie, I very much enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. Yeah, you're a lot of fun. And I know people are going to enjoy <laughs> seeing your work. And now I get to, I'm going to go back to the Portland Art Gallery and I'm going to take a look and I'll be like, hmm, wonder what was happening in her life during that time. You can ask me. Yeah, absolutely. Me. We'll connect those dots. Yeah. It's, it's nice to working in encaustic because you can touch it. Not in the gallery, maybe. Okay. I don't allow that. But, so. um, but I encourage people to to ask me if they can touch the work. And it's, it's nice to have that tactile experience and for people to really experience the work. Well, maybe someday I'll come to your house and, and you can allow me to touch yes. the work at your house. Yes, absolutely. That way we'll draw the line so people aren't <laughs> going into the gallery just putting their hands up on the wall. That would be a little weird, but, um, but still, very exciting stuff. And um, I know you and I have known each other for a yeah. while, and so it's great to Long kind time. of reconnect with you. Yes, thank you so much. This is a great opportunity. I've been speaking with artist Annie Darling, and I think after having this conversation, you're going to want to actually go to the Portland Art Gallery and see some of her work and maybe actually connect with her, and maybe she'll let you touch her encaustic pieces. It's an exciting time for Annie Darling. I'm Dr. Lisa Belial. This is Radio Maine. Thank you for watching or listening. Thank you, Annie. Thank you.